My name's Richard Chambers. I'm a mindfulness consultant here at Monash. And in this, the second part of this presentation, we're gonna talk about what mindfulness is. So you've heard about what some of the mental health statistics are and some of the problems that law students and lawyers face. And so in this session, we're gonna talk about what you can actually do about that. Um, and you may have noticed, let me just state the obvious, the mind just wanders all the time, particularly when we're stressed, particularly when the pressure's on, our minds just have a habit of wandering off to the future, to the past, getting caught up in judgments, reactions, that kind of thing. And, th and there's a name for this. It's, researchers are now calling it default mode. You know, it's the default mode of the human brain to wander off. And it turns out that when we're not engaged in what we're doing, so when we're not actually paying attention and engaged in the activity, that we're doing, the mind just very naturally wanders off into this mode, you know, that, that mind wandering, the mental chatter that I'm sure you've noticed a lot throughout your life. Um, and our brains are actually wired for distraction. This is what the research that Craig was talking about before actually points out to us. And we're also wired to look for problems. Our brain just scans the environment constantly for problems. And, you know, 40,000 years ago when the brain was evolving, those problems were, you know, threats to our life, like saber-toothed tigers and that kind of thing. And now, of course, 40,000 years later, it's 2014, it's relatively safe in Melbourne, Australia, but what we, what we find is that the, the, the brain just keeps looking for, for problems. You know, and these days, of course, it's deadlines and it's job interviews and it's assessments, that kind of thing. Um, and we also tend to do a lot of stuff on automatic pilot. You might have noticed that, just how easy it is once you've become familiar with something, to do it on automatic without really paying attention to it. You know, the classical example is walking into your house, thinking of something else and putting down your keys or your phone and then going to leave later on. And where's your phone? Where's your, where are my keys, right? Or driving, you know, if you drive somewhere, you know, you might at times get to the destination and turn off your ignition and really can't remember the journey. And so, of course, this has a, you know, creates the potential for a range of different problems, car accidents, getting lost, losing things, making mistakes. And of course, when we communicate in this way, when we study in this way, it reduces our effectiveness and can cause problems for us. And what we're actually finding in the research is that these, this default brain, this default activity, actually um, results in activation of very specific parts of the brain that we're calling default circuits. And um, what we're also finding, as you can see in the slide here, in the blue, in the top, these are the circuits of the brain that actually become active when we're in that default mode. So if we left any of you in an MRI for five minutes and just went and watched the screen, pretty quickly your mind would wander off. And these are the parts that would light up. And what you see in the bottom, in the red, these are the parts of the brain that degenerate first or develop what are called amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's, which is a type of dementia. And if you know anything at all about dementia, you'd know it's got a lot to do with mind wandering and not being present. And you'll notice an inescapable, obvious relationship here. And, and what we're actually finding is that too much default activity early in life is a risk factor for a whole range of mental health problems later in life. So here's a, here's a list of some of the more common ones. Stress, obviously, as the mind wanders off and gets caught up in worrying about what if, rather than focusing on what is. This can lead to anxiety, to depression, attentional problems like ADHD, even things like schizophrenia, autism, criminality, and of course, reduced performance. Because if we're sitting in a class and just not listening, or if someone's tell giving us some information, or if we're trying to study and our minds wandered off somewhere else, we're not gonna be performing at our peak. And that's one of, the, one of the other things that mindfulness can help us with. Now, those of you who know about mindfulness will have heard of mindfulness meditation, mindfulness exercises, and that's critical to what we're talking about here, and we'll get onto that. But to begin with, I wanna present mindfulness to you in a much more everyday, general kind of way. And actually, we all have moments of mindfulness throughout the day. So this slide here, for me, perfectly captures what we're talking about with mindfulness. And I'm gonna guess that most of you, hopefully all of you, can relate to the experience of sitting and watching the sun go down and just being effortlessly present, not trying to focus on this beautiful sunset, not pushing away thoughts or trying to not think of your unpaid bills, but actually just being there, noticing what you can see, noticing the sound of the gently lapping waves, the seagulls, you know, that kind of thing, and just being present and engaged in the senses. For some people, being outside in nature, bushwalking, hiking, or just taking the dog down to the park is a time that they're really in their senses, feeling their feet hitting the ground, hearing the crunching leaves, feeling the breeze, the birds, that kind of thing. 
um, exercise in general. And here I'm talking more about actually getting into the body, noticing the breath, going out for a run you know, outside rather than getting on a treadmill in the gym and putting in the headphones and watching TV, of course, which is, looks a bit more like default mode to me. Um, if you like to cook, you know, there, there, are, there are the colours, the smells, the textures, the tastes, and then of course sharp knives and fire have a way of bringing us into the present moment as well. So for a lot of people, cooking is a time that they're really engaged. And in fact, the list is endless. If you think about what your hobbies are, what your interests are, they're probably things that engage you in your senses. Because as we'll discover, there's something really nice about being present and in the, in the present moment engaged in the senses that tends to lead to happiness, relaxation, and therefore these things become things that we seek out naturally. And so it's obviously much easier to experience being present and engaged when we're doing things that we enjoy, our hobbies, our activities, or just sitting and watching the sun go down. And for most of us, it's a little harder in situations like this, where we're trying to study, trying to finish an assignment, where we're sitting in an exam, or when the pressure's on. For most of us, these are times that we go off into default mode, either just daydreaming about something more pleasant, or worrying about what's gonna happen, or judging and reacting to what's happening in the situation that we're in. And so in moments like this, mindfulness becomes a practice. It becomes something that we can actually practice. And of course, anything we practice, we get better at. And what we can cultivate is the ability to engage in the senses, to actually come into the present by feeling what's happening, by tasting the food that we're eating, by, by listening while we're having conversations, to notice when the attention wanders off. Now we can't stop that happening, but we can get better at noticing when it has and therefore quicker at coming back. And then we spend more time in the present moment. And so as we practice this and cultivate it, we actually start to be more engaged and more present. And so we can talk about deliberately engaging our attention in the senses. And of course, here we're talking about doing it in a way where we're not doing any further thinking or judgment about the fact that our minds wandered off or where it's gone to, because that would take us further into default mode. We can say it's about being aware of what's happening while it's happening. And it's a type of awareness that actually emerges when we do this. Or more simply put, it's just living in the moment, being in the now. I mean, we all know that this is a really good idea, but what we're talking about today is a practical and effective way of actually bringing this about. And we know this stuff. I mean, we're not making this up. This wasn't invented by doctors or psychologists. You know, we, we talk about being mindful of things like fine print, taking, taking, you know, paying attention, taking care. And we have all these sensory metaphors in our language, like being in touch, you know, being literally in, in touch with what's happening. So we recognise on some level that this is a useful thing to do. We should say as well that mindfulness is not about always being in the present. I mean, as humans, we have to plan for the future. We have to remember what happened. As students, as lawyers, of course, we need to be able to think through what's going on in the present moment. So mindfulness is not about stopping that or somehow always being present, but it's just about recognising where our attention is from moment to moment. Because it's one thing to be planning for your exams coming up or thinking about what you're doing tomorrow, and something very different to be worrying, obsessing, dwelling, that kind of thing. And so as we practice mindfulness, we get better at recognising where our attention is from moment to moment. And you might catch yourself having a daydream and then just realise that actually you're waiting for a train or that there's nothing better that you could be doing in that moment. And you might choose to keep having that daydream. It might lead to some creativity, it might just be pleasant. Or you might realise that you're actually in that moment sitting in an exam, sitting in a lecture, driving on the freeway in the rain. And that might be a time that you'd want to bring your attention back to what's actually going on. So if you're interested in practising any of this, there are a range of guided mindfulness meditation practices that we make available to all the students at Monash. And you can find these just by Googling Monash Mindfulness. You'll find our webpage, Mindfulness at Monash. And uh, there's a link to a Moodle site with all of these resources. Um, what happens in the brain when we meditate is each time our attention wanders off and we just bring it back without any judgment or elaboration, we actually activate uh, circuits in the prefrontal cortex. So you can see on the right here in, in the diagram, these are prefrontal circuits and, and the insula as well. On the left, you'll see these are the default circuits. So every time our mind wanders off, these are the parts of the brain, obviously, that are activated. And if we start to judge that, that we're doing it wrong, that we shouldn't be doing that, or if we start to think about it, why am I having this thought, or why has my mind wandered off, we activate these circuits even further. And of course, what we practice, we get better at. And so as we, as we practice mindfulness, we get better at recognising when the attention's wandered off and coming back without judgement. Um, 
You might also hear about this sometimes talked about as mindfulness exercises and of course the word exercise implies that we can actually develop a mental fitness and we can, we can actually literally develop a mindful muscle through practicing this and that's what's happening in the brain each time the attention wanders and we bring it back we literally form new connections between the neurons in the prefrontal cortex and as we do that over and over again we form more and more connections and um, those circuits become stronger. Actually the neurons have to move further apart to accommodate the connections and the prefrontal cortex actually grows like a muscle. Um, yeah, so we know that the brain uh, is, is 125 billion neurons with 200 trillion connections and every time we experience something new neurons wire up and so whatever we experience over and over again shapes our brain, shapes our experience. This is the prefrontal cortex you can see here in the green and uh, this is where uh, what's called executive function is housed. Now executive function, you could think about the, the control panel for your brain. This is the part of the brain that controls all other conscious mental functions and some unconscious ones as well. And one of the key components of executive function is attentional control. And that's why each time the attention wanders and we bring it back, we form new connections here. This is the part of the brain as well that helps us to think and to reason and to plan. So very, very effective, very useful, very powerful part of the brain. It's where our short-term memory is largely housed. It's the part of the brain that helps us to regulate our emotions. So if you're feeling upset, angry, and you calm yourself down, prefrontal cortex. Inhibiting impulses. If you're working on an assignment and your phone goes off and it's a Snapchat or an Instagram or a Facebook update and you go to check it and you don't because you want to finish your assignment, prefrontal cortex. It's also the part of the brain that helps us to be aware of what's happening in our body and our mind and around us from moment to moment. So a very useful part of the brain. Evolutionarily the most recent to evolve and it's the, it's, it's the last part of the brain to grow. Between 15 and 25 years old it's doing most of its growing. And what the research shows, of course, is that people who practice mindfulness literally strengthen this part of their brain. We see actual growth, just like a muscle, in the prefrontal cortex. Also in the hippocampus, which, which you'll see here on the right, down the bottom, this is the part of the brain that helps us to lay down long-term memories. So it's a very, very useful thing educationally to practice mindfulness. And that's why there's a whole lot of research now showing that mindfulness is very, very powerful for reducing stress, anxiety, depression, treating sleep problems, you know, meditating before getting into bed at night time particularly really helps people get to sleep. And of course improves performance, cognitive performance, academic and work performance, improves our self-awareness, helps us to communicate more effectively with more empathy, compassion, that kind of thing. Um, so mindfulness, we can talk about being attention regulation and there are two components here, you know, of attention regulation, attention and attitude. So when we talk about attention regulation, this, this requires three things, knowing where our attention is, prioritising where we really need it to be, and being able to redirect it and keep it there. And the attitude I've talked about already is one of openness, curiosity and acceptance, where we're not judging what we're experiencing, we're not getting caught up in further thinking, we're just allowing things to be as they are. And so for this reason, a growing number of sporting figures, public figures, um, very, a lot of people are practicing mindfulness now. Novak Djokovic's team, his coaching team, introduced mindfulness practice into his training in 2010. And uh, what's that, what, what, that, what that's helped him to do is to, if he drops a set, drops a game, just to let go of that, not carry that into the next set, but actually just to let it go and refocus and get himself back into the present moment. And so there's something of a mindful revolution happening. You know, it's, it's, it's no longer sort of, it, 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 it's some ancient technology, but it's now very, very much front and centre. And this, this quote here from William James really sums up why Monash supports uh, mindfulness in, in an educational space and is, is, is bringing it in. Because, you know, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character and will. So no one is compass sui, you know, of sound mind if they, if they don't have that. And that an education which would directly train that and help people to improve that would be the best kind of education that you can get. So in the next section I'm going to hand back to Craig and he's going to talk about the stress response and uh, its implications for health and how mindfulness can actually help us to notice some of the mental habits that give rise to stress and to therefore reduce that. Mm -hmm.